just share my screen. Um, is, is there a chat box as well? Yeah, do you want me to? I'll keep an eye on the chat box and I can like... Because if anyone's got any questions or whatever, then find, pop them in there. Cool, thanks. All right. Can you see that? Yeah, that's great. Can, can, you, can you see a miniature you? I can see a miniature me and a miniature you. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's all right. <laughs> I'm just making sure, right, so you can see see that picture then. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, um, so my name is Lee Ivert and I practice under the name Baxendale, um, which uh, is my mum's maiden name. And uh, there's not, not, not really a, any longer story to that other than it's my mum's maiden name. Um, and I'm an architect uh, who has spent the last, the most, the majority of the last 20 years in Glasgow, um, as I was, I was just kind of talking about. Um, and I ended up in Glasgow from Preston, uh, where I was born, raised, uh, and went there to study architecture. And I suppose in the in the kind of process of getting an architectural education um, at, at Strathclyde University, I became very frustrated with various aspects of uh, architectural practice and architectural education kind of on, on that journey. I was kind of um, always maintained the kind of desire and the dream of becoming an architect whilst I was at university. Um, but I was kind of frustrated with, I suppose, a certain lack of immediacy um, with it as a, as a, as a discipline and, and as an output in, in a very strange way because we all experience architecture every day. We exist in it, we behave in it, we react to it, we react, react against it. Um, it. It brings us joy, brings us pain. And yet as a subject, it kind of presents itself in quite um, a, 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 a quite an abstract way often and quite an impenetrable way. And as, and as something that takes a long, long time to realize, you know, so you, you do a huge amount of architectural education, you know, five years of study, two years of work. And throughout that whole period, you might actually never build anything, you know, which is, is quite ridiculous. Um, and so I, I was always keen on um, trying to find ways of making things um, quickly making things as experiments and making things as a as an act of research and, a, a, and as an, an act of inquiry and as a means of, of learning as well you know so I was quite I, I was and I'm still a massive believer in, in learning through doing and a lot of architecture as a as, a, as an education a discipline kind of leaves the, the, the doing bit of architecture to the to the last minute and often takes quite a lot of money and quite a lot of time to get there. So I was always quite enticed by you know the potential immediacy that is available to I suppose different forms of art practice, um, different forms of social practice, different forms of creative practice where quite often whether it's yeah theatre, visual art, you can improvise, you know, you can kind of create that immediately in real time as a as a direct response um to, to 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 anything to a situation to a given place and people so when i um entered my final year of uh, architectural education which is which ended up being a master's degree in urban design i rejected the kind of um the accepted project on the urban design course which was to create a theoretical master plan and decided that i was interested in creating a whole sense of a strategy of small scale interventions um, in the north of glasgow which through their realization would ask questions suggest answers and and maybe start you know kind of moving things on in a in a, in a more incremental organic way so this this image is kind of the first live projects that I ever did basically um, and this 
image in th th this basically in my final year of architecture I'd, I'd been studying the canal in Glasgow and I walked the full length of the kind of Glasgow branch of the canal and realized there was there wasn't a single place to sit along the canal and there wasn't a single place to put your rubbish along the canal and the other thing I noticed that there was lots lot po pockets of kind of um, rubbish and debris beer cans um, bottles cigarette butts and stuff where people were coming and socializing but quite often just fishing chatting talking but there was no even basic infrastructure to support that activity. So then that activity starts to get demonized as being antisocial, when actually it's quite the opposite. It's actually really social. Um, and so I was interested again in a kind of what an immediate response to that might be. So I got some old pallets, um, I got some concrete, I cast some concrete um, in, in my bedroom, and, and I took this wood and this concrete down to uh, this uh, bit of the canal in Glasgow one Saturday and I just started building a bench and a bin and at the same time these these guys were just a, a little bit away from where I was doing the things I was speaking about before fishing smoking drinking having a chat and I, I kind of started building this thing and they came over and they're like what the, what, what the fuck are you doing and I was like well I'm building a bench and a bin and they said, well, why are you doing that? I said, well, you, you don't have anywhere to sit or put your rubbish. And they're like, oh, yeah, good point. And so they jumped on board and gave me a beer and helped make this thing as a little experiment. And and I kind of, and, and I think that the kind of point of that, the, the, the thing that I learned from that exercise was really how the kind of act of participating in a place and participating with the people of that place is, is, a, is a massive way of learning about the, the, the dynamics and the condition of a given situation. And, and, and by being active um, and by creating curiosity as an invitation to engage, the conversations that emerge from that are actually much more natural, they're built on more trust, they're more organic, and then perhaps going into a situation and asking those people and asking that situation to participate with your own engagement process or your own kind of consultation process. So I kind of, in a lot of the work that I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you, I've kind of maybe rejected some accepted modes of kind of community engagement practice and community consultation practice that looks at ways of getting people to participate in something that you know an architect a designer or an artist is doing and a lot of the work is really about me participating in that place in some way as a means of creating uh, an opportunity for um, curiosity that leads to an opportunity for a for a conversation so this was another piece that i did whilst i was doing my degree as well we had just worked with a local youth club who had been graffitiing their names all over this area uh, and said, well, rather than just writing it in pen on walls, I'll let you write it in concrete and then we'll cast it and we'll put it permanently somewhere in a, in a way that's maybe more useful than, than seen as being destructive. Um, and so another thing I'm interested in is, is very much engaging with the existing culture and the existing patterns of behavior in a place and not immediately kind of demonizing that behavior as something antisocial you know so so like I said before with the fishermen you know some of the their behavior by some people is deemed as antisocial but actually is very social and these kids going about writing on things is also social even though um, it might be illegal or it might be an act of vandalism so I'm trying to find a way of taking a desire to express and a desire, desire to create and still giving that uh, an output of some description and the other thing that um, I'm, I'm kind of particularly interested in is um, the idea of um, undesigning things I suppose in a way but try, trying to design and create experiences that are open to multiple modes of interpretation um, and kind of yeah so so I think everything I'm, I'm probably going to show you is basically just an exercise in creating curiosity and creating a mode of engagement without me being precious about 
how people are going to engage with this thing that I've made or designed or created with, with, with a group of people. Uh, and, and so this, this is an old image of uh, which, which inspires me a lot, which shows children using the graveyard in the gorbals as a playground. And, you know, the kind of idea that the one thing that scared me the most as a child might actually be something that facilitates joy and delight and play and excitement. Is quite interesting that actually, if you kind of free your mind of a whole range of pre preconceptions and conditioning, then actually all space, all place, um, all situations have the opportunity to be something more than than you maybe expect or, or anticipated. Um, so I think the the projects I'm, I'm going to just draw a bit of attention to kind of look at this act of participation in a, in, in a place and an act of participating with people at a, a variety of scales, because I'm interested in this kind of act of making as a, as a mode of inquiry. And I'm also interested in the act of making as a, as a kind of catalyst for something greater than that initial act. Uh, and I'm interested in it um, as a means of suggesting possibilities that then can be acted on and developed um, organically and incrementally. Uh, and I'm interested in the kind of act of making as a way of um, prototyping and testing um, and building um, capacity, you know, in, in a place or with people, um, which then, then can, can, can develop and, and grow over time. But sometimes the kind of the work is, you know, in some senses, um, a kind of immediate and indulgent response to a particular situation. And this, this project involved um, yeah, you, using the kind of act of making as a way of registering the condition of uh, shipyards, um, which were currently kind of either, either derelict or kind of threatened with some form of quite extreme regeneration. You know, so situations that were kind of post industrial landscapes um where now big you know big big change was being proposed um flats apartments cinemas shopping centers etc and and there's a question about kind of what that then does to the kind of um tangible and intangible heritage of these places so this project involved um, responding to a site in Govan and responding to a site in Gdansk that are both linked to shipbuilding. And what we discovered on the site um, was a load of, in Govan, what we discovered on the site was a load of rope. And this rope was just lying on the site. And myself and an artist called Ben Parry, who, who I work with, decided that we would, we would create something with this rope that we found on the site. Uh, we, we would also invite um, some local gr groups to, to kind of come onto the site with us and, and make this thing with us. And we just wanted to create a kind of temporary sanctuary space or shelter space that registered the kind of the sound of the place um, and just created just two particular views, like one that would look right back towards Govan over here and the other which looks towards the Science Centre, which is kind of an ex pre-existing example of, you know, kind of cultural regeneration on, on, on a post-industrial landscape. And this is what we made. This is what we built. Um, we, we built it over the course of three days. Um, and um, it was kind of it inhabited for a couple of days. Um, and then it was set on fire, um, which was which was OK. No one, no one got hurt. Uh, but and, and quite interesting as a thing that then was just quite yeah, immediate, transient. But it, but it meant that through the act of making that, we kind of met all the kids who hang out on this site. We met people who go on the site to photograph it. We met people on the site who go there for a drink. We met people on the site who uh, go to walk the dog. And we kind of, the, the, the process of making this then helped map the kind of existing social condition of this um, site, you know, that, that's described, again, it's derelict and accessible, but actually is full of life and full of activity, whether, whether it should be or, or not is, is, is obviously, um, you know, kind of a, a question. 
that other people are asking. But it is, and we were, we were interested in that, and making this helped document and register the kind of activity that existed there. And then when we went to Gdansk, this is me inside it, and you can kind of see all, all we kind of tied all the rope to the timber frame that we made. And then we went to Gdansk, we wanted to replicate that process, and we got extremely lucky in that um, on down by uh, the, one of the shipyards in Gdansk, um, on the night that we arrived in Gdansk, uh, another artist who was part of the, the wider project that we were doing went to an opening in a, a building that had been taken over by artists in the, in the shipyards. Um, went, yeah, went to an opening of an exhibition there and then found they had a huge amount of old shipping rope lying in a lane down by the side. Um, and so it's kind of total amazing fortuitous kind of coincidence that that then provided us with this opportunity to kind of replicate the same act of making and the same act of engagement um, in Gdansk. Um, and the, the rope was pretty much the same thickness, but there's a kind of range of it with being black and some of it being kind of white and and we made we made a different form different kind of object that was again more suited to its particular context but again that kind of act of creating um the act of making created this uh situation that that forced us to engage with these artists who um, had, had adopted this space, the situation, it forced us to collaborate, it forced us to find out where you buy timber in Gdansk, it forced us to find out where you buy cable ties in Gdansk, it forced us to um, find out who has a flatbed pickup truck, who can take you to get more of this rope. Um, and it kind of forced us to find out where you get a coffee, it for, you know, it's, it's, it's like, just forcing yourself to be be active and present, uh, but then registering the impact of that presence is is, is exceptionally useful. Um, and in the background, again, you can see this creep of regeneration, which I'm not saying is a intrinsically a, a bad thing. But you know, the kind of questions I suppose we're asking is like, you know, who is this for? What is the impact? All of this land is now going to be. Um, built on uh, new apartments you know so so th this is kind of the i suppose big change putting its tanks on the lawn to kind of fatten up the rest of this for it to become favorable for development you know if you if you want to kind of talk about this in a cynical way um or it's an amazing interesting unique piece of contemporary architecture that celebrates poland's role in world war ii um and, and maybe it's both of those things and, and that's okay so this this um, actually has the, the the artists who were using this building then had to leave, so it could get knocked down to build apartments. But then they were actually offered another building on the shipyards, and they got a big truck and they picked this up, stuck it on the back of a truck, and they took it to their new um, spot in in Gdansk. So it's kind of still still there uh, about three years later. Um, being kind of used as a kind of little place of shelter or something sculptural. So the kind of this kind of, so there's that kind of opportunity, you know, a, a, a mode of a kind of aspects of what I do that is just kind of a very immediate improvised response to a situation. And then there's obviously times when that response is more focused, is more tactical, has a very specific outcome. And something that I started 10 years ago in Glasgow so, uh, um, with, with um, the, a neighbourhood in, in, uh, called Woodlands was a community garden. Um, and this site had been derelict for uh, 40 years. Um, and various people had tried to get it to work in terms of putting flats on it and things like that. Um, but then there's kind of historic issues with undermining. Um, but luckily this site had actually passed into the, the ownership of a community development trust which which had was about 20 odd years old this community development trust but had never kind of figured out what they could do with it uh, and then someone i was working with at the time uh, set up a kind of garden exchange project in this area and at the same time i bought a flat right opposite this site and um we, we kind of suggested that you could turn it into a community garden maybe just temporary 
um, whilst they sorted the site out so they could sell it and get a return and invest that money back into the community. So we kind of um, started working on this site and clearing it and we, we had like an immense uptake, you know, just by flyering the neighborhood and advertising that we were going to start working on it. We, we had loads of volunteers step forward um, to, to start to, you know, start turning this into something interesting, something special. And one of the kind of key um, things for me about this project that was really important was, was, that, was that it wouldn't just be a place for growing food, you know, and that if we, if we did want to kind of um, advocate for, you know, urban gardening, urban growing, food sustainability, then we should also offer other things um, that would that would entice people into that environment who might not be interested in growing food, um, but would be interested in other things. But then by being in that situation and seeing other people growing food, might then they'll start to kind of um, be, be curious enough to participate in that. Um, and this guy liked to come down and just make rocking donkeys out of wood, you know, and, and that's that's fine. Uh, that was fine. And other people came down and just started growing food immediately as we were kind of building raised beds and building paths. Um, and I suppose the, the, the thing that I was involved in terms of design was a kind of basic infrastructure of footpaths and raised beds. Um, but then everything around that then was kind of up for grabs. Anyone could kind of suggest um, something to create or to make um, and anyone could kind of bring an idea and then kind of be given the support and the agency to kind of create that idea. And the other thing that we, we built on the site uh, was just a kind of place of shelter uh, where you could have meetings, you could have exhibitions, you could have performances. Um, so the site became you know, a kind of cultural venue as much as it being a, an environmental venue or a food growing uh, site. Um, and the other thing that, that we did was made sure we didn't build uh, a fence with a locked gate around it. So this, this site has always been accessible um, 24 hours a day. And at the time, you know, a lot of community gardens and a lot of community growing spaces that were getting built in Glasgow, you know, we're also having, you know, two and a half metre, three metre high metal fences um, built around them because people were worried about vandalism and worried about um, things getting stolen and, and we just kind of decided to, to trust the situation and, and we did actually get vandalism, we did get some issues but I tended to speak to the perpetrators of that and kind of brought a lot of those people on board um, actually after, after the event and once people knew actually it was a place for anyone at any time um, that side of things actually kind of calmed down considerably. But you can see that there's performances happening, um, there's food getting made and cooked, there's cinema and art and, you know, a whole range of activities. But that, but the other kind of impact of that project was that the group, Woodlands Community Development Trust and Woodlands Community Garden kind of regained the experience of doing things, of creating things, of getting funding, of then employing people, of managing a project and, and that then has kind of grown and grown and um, over the last four or five years uh, the Women's Community Development Trust have also managed to get another site a few doors down from that one and um, we commissioned uh, another architect that I know to start designing a much you know, more refined um, intervention on this site, a proper a, a room for the neighbourhood um, where, where people can can do anything they want really and then this is the precursor to a whole range of um, prefabricated units that are going to go on another part of the site which artists and creative people and other people in the community can use and, and rent as their own workspace. So that this kind of, so, so for me the kind of heartening thing again is about just kind of using a kind of immediate um, active engagement with the site but also thinking in this project longer term about how you, you use that experience to create a momentum that, that doesn't stop. You know, and this, this is now, you know, 10 years on, the project is not one that is in decline. You know, the, the project is one that is, continues to grow and continues to gather strength. And I think that that is because it, it, it started small 
and and it's built that size slowly and incrementally rather than kind of having like a, a massive big idea at the beginning and not doing anything until it kind of realized that that one big idea and another kind of thinking again i suppose in, in another scale and, and trying to think about then how some of these kind of tactics and these methods you know, it, like what, what i kind of learned from that project was very much that you um that you can explore a place without over designing it you know and, and as a designer as an architect you know we are under a lot of pressure to you know draw everything to an immense amount of detail and cost it to an immense amount of detail before we're allowed to build anything uh, and that that's like i kind of said before it's very frustrating um for all kinds of reasons um and so that project in woodlands was great because it showed me that there was a way of actually kind of improvising a project and also that you could design something up to a certain point that created a certain level of infrastructure and then you could trust people to engage with that in their own way and for the thing to still be kind of um both conceptually and spatially and and socially kind of robust to take that experimentation and this isn't venice and um, this is also in glasgow but this again was a kind of a project that that I did, did for a year on a derelict site that took the kind of learnings from uh, the kind of project like Woodlands and suggested, well, yeah, what if that infrastructure is really, really basic and it's just some shipping containers, it's just some paths, it's a, it's a tool, it's a toolkit, it's a fire, and then you just let anyone come into that space and use that infrastructure to kind of keep building the space or let people come in at that space and they say, all right, we'd really like to put on a film. And then we build the infrastructure to put on a film or I really want to put on a dance and we build a stage or whatever. So so this again relied on using graphics, um, using using kind of art to create curiosity that invites an engagement with this this facade and, and, and uh, invites people to find out what's behind it. And then, starts to then kind of take a very empty derelict site and over time um turn it into something that i can't or don't predict um and this is kind of you know like a kind of image of, of of it you know kind of four or five months after that that image where built stalls built adventure play things there's a mud kitchen down there there's a a, a massive screen here and raked seating and a stage over there and there's bunting and there's banners and and it's kind of full of life and activity um but the only thing that was kind of like designed was these pallet paths and the roof over two shipping containers so i was then invited to uh, two years ago i was invited to represent scotland um at the venice architecture biennale um myself my colleague um at the time ambrose gillick and an arts organization based in glasgow wave particle um who were the lead curators of our project kind of were, were, were selected to um yeah represent scotland at the architecture biennale and what i was keen to do was to to, to not go to the venice biennale and just present my work you know to present images of the work or present or do a workshop about the work or present the projects i've done but to actually deliver a project in Venice using the same methods and the same te techniques and the same tactics. And, um, and so what I was presenting in Venice was a mode of practice, not stuff that I'd done you know, previously. And also to see if that mode of practice also worked in an extremely different context that I was used to working in, um, which in you know, Venice is a, is a very specific type of place. And doing something in the context of a, an, an architecture biennale or an art biennale totally obviously subverts kind of what you're doing and why you're doing it and how you're doing it and who it's for. So we we were very keen to spend time engaging. We, we found a site and a location, which Susie will also talk to you about later because she stayed there, um, that was nowhere near the kind of main activity of the biennale. It was in a, a, a different area called Dosodoro. Uh, and we managed to get this piece of land at the back of a palazzo called Palazzo Zenobio, 
um, which also happened to be one of the locations where Madonna filmed Like a Virgin, which is a fun fact. And we thought, you know, it's really interesting that there's some green space like in Venice that, you know, you, you, there's kind of these like pockets of green space like this aren't something that you see that often as a visitor and quite often do become privatised and maybe aren't accessible to the community either. So we wanted to open this up to this community and we wanted to build an infrastructure that would allow people to come into this space and do a whole variety of things. Um, screen a film against this wall, play some sport, use this goalpost, um, build things, um, do theatre, work with artists, create things, build dens, like whatever. whatever. So. I was kind of interested then, obviously, like saying, spending some time documenting the place, the activity of the place, the physicality of the place, the architecture of the place. Um, I was intrigued by a, a culture of creating temporary architecture in Venice or um, uh, for, for festivals or for kind of turning your roof into a terrace or for protecting you from water. I was kind of, so I was, I was kind of interested in mapping and documenting all of these existing cultures of behavior that, that used temporary interventions in, in a kind of creative way that was born out of kind of a, a certain need. Um, and also then interested in kind of engaging in, in things that you'd never see as a tourist, you know, it's kind of the, the social aspects of Venice that are kind of hidden away um, behind what the tourists see. Uh, these old guys have this amazing place to play this game, bocce ball, kind of Italian version of indoor bowls, um, a local carpenter, um, and kind of kind of then thinking about how the project that we could do could encapsulate all of these things that I'd noticed, water, lanes, towers, tops, boardwalks, platforms, life, colour. Um, and then also, as with previous work, spending time I found some wood on the site and I just wanted to make something um, really immediate as a response um, to the location and also myself Peter from Wave Particle we spent time thinking about how we could immediately engage people in the existing public spaces of Venice as a means of also then informing our design and our project so we kind of found this massive metal wall which which are put up in the squares for political parties to put posters on during election times um, and then we kind of turned this into a kind of massive weird game of volleyball um, and uh, got just invited anyone in the square to kind of participate in, in this with us. So, so all of that kind of active research then starts to inform a, a kind of proposal on that site. Um, which incorporates towers and colours and lanes and water um, and shapes and is kind of you know visualised as a proposition and is also designed in such a way that people can keep adding things onto it or string things off it or build more of it um, and and we we start to kind of visualise what that might look like in the in on the site and. Um, and and the, the name of the entire project is conceived by Peter's happenstance. And you know what we're trying to create is an infrastructure, an armature that allows happenstance to occur. In a sense, it's like people go there, and you trust that interesting things are going to happen by providing a, a, a kind of background, something to respond to that then draws out people's other people's ideas and other people's agency. And then we make that. Um, and again, the act of making it in a different country where you have to have things delivered on a boat um, and you have to find timber and wood and tools is all very interesting in itself. And we involved again local people in, in the act of making it as well. Um, and over kind of 12 days in advance of the Biennale opening, we, we, we built this kind of infrastructure which was designed to connect into this lane on one side and the garden on the other so you can kind of see it now appearing so it's a kind of continuation of this thin lane that draws you right into the, the greenery of the garden um, and you know creating something as well that 
makes a previously inaccessible situation accessible in all kinds of ways. You know, not not just in the sense that no one had access to this garden before, but also that people of any ability, um, any situation, any uh, you know, it feels um, that, that that this is a space for them that they can engage with. So this kind of final output then is then allowed to evolve. We also kind of had an exhibition in this space preceding the, the installation and people are just invited to then engage and respond in whatever way they see fit and people come along because they've been on a bike and they build a little ramp um, families start coming and hanging out here and playing games um, we provide tools um, and, and our own expertise so that people can uh, build things and we teach kids how to make things and build things and families just come along and we had this thing unfinished element where people could just take the scrap wood from the large installation put it up and start building this um, little shelter and and it was amazing how the people in this community just bought into this like immediately straight away um, and without fear and everyone could kind of write the name leave the name on their little bit of wood that they added and it wasn't it wasn't just a playground, you know, it was it was a, a social space, it's a cultural place, it's a productive space, it's a place to have a party, it's a place to play a game, it's a place to make things and build things, uh, it's again a place to ex explore your own ideas and agency, um, it's a space to play. Um, and then, you know, for me it's about kind of just totally letting go of this thing that we've made and allowing whatever transpires to kind of transpire but always be you know having things in the background that kind of support that activity um and, and help facilitate it and, and this again you kind of being used as a an outdoor uh, cinema as well outdoor place of performance so the final kind of couple of projects um that are, are kind of most recent in the last couple of years i've been working with some artists, uh, Anna Francis and Rebecca Davis in Stoke-on-Trent on a project that they've been developing called the Portland Inn Project, which currently I think is probably the best you know, example of a socially engaged community and arts-led project where this um, pub had been shut down by the council, um, has become semi-derelict, and uh, Anna and Rebecca, Anna who lives on one of these streets, uh, had invited Rebecca to come and do some work with her a few years ago and um, to start doing arts activity on this green space and then they'd managed to get the keys to this pub and perform, you know, do some activity inside it but it was not really in a condition where they could continue doing that and um, so they then kind of had the idea and the dream of, of getting ownership of this for the community and developing it into um, a community um, social and art space um, but in but in the meantime, they didn't want to again like wait until they had permission to do that, wait until they had the money to do that, wait until um, they they they'd drawn up plans and they they'd kind of um, got got you know that that maybe three four or five years. And what they wanted to make sure they do is every summer they they would be running activity on this green space for local people. But this green space is very very contested. Um, the, the, the kind of huge issue with uh, drug addiction um and um crime in this area and so this, this was very very contested a lot of kids and families didn't feel comfortable using it and so we're trying to find ways of drawing attention to people who use this site for drug use but in a positive way so that actually all of a sudden that issue is is, is given some um visibility but not demonized um uh in in a way that kind of just keeps pushing a problem you know behind closed doors and but at the same time just prove to people that you can you know take ownership of these spaces and actually if you do take ownership of them and, and utilize them in different ways then possibilities emerge uh, and it also then acts as a, as a way of testing and building the capacity for this community to, to take on a bigger project by delivering a smaller project so the first summer Anna and Rebecca and the community had just used the marquee for the activity or a tent, but they had to take that down every night and put it back up. So this year they asked me if I could come up with something that could be, per, you know, not be permanent, but be there for kind of like 10 weeks over the summer 
um, and which they could run a whole variety of activity from. And you kind of, you know, there'd been various recent issues, again, kind of fire damage, um, vandalism, um, the, the, there's a drug dealer in this house, um, there's a, a brothel in this house, um, and the, so, so the kind of, the, there's a perception of this street that wasn't positive, um, but we, we kind of, let's say, kind of keen to engage with life as it is, not as we want it to be, or as anyone thinks it should be, and to to kind of create um, a kind of positive, you know, positive situations um, without kind of demonizing what's already there. So I kind of decided to use re uh, recycled scaffolding um, because we could quickly erect it. It's a simple thing people can kind of also get involved in um, and kind of have a space that can be used for performance, have a space that's enclosed that can be used for workshops and activity and have a space that kind of exists under a tree that's a little kind of quieter moment, little place of sanctuary. So we... Um, we got we managed to source all the second hand scaffolding and you know wanted to do something again that kind of had a certain language that uh, created curiosity created a um delight fun joy uh, and over the course of five six days we we kind of put this um together and also referencing the pub in different ways with the color the chimney the, the yellow, the green, um, the, the kind of the grey, and and kind of created this thing that had an enclosure, had a little stage, but also something that you could kind of wrap more over if you kind of wanted to then enclose this stage to keep the rain off for an outdoor performance. Then this this kind of frame as an infrastructure then provided the opportunity to do that. Um, and this is the inside getting used, uh, and this is the stage getting used. Um, and, and kind of again just being used for a, a gathering um, and a meeting. And the kind of final uh, project which is the, th uh, the thing that I'm working on at the moment so I, I, I'm as, as, you know my kind of main role at the moment is actually running an architecture uh, course in my hometown of Preston um, and so I um, like the course director um, at the Grenfell Baines Institute of Architecture, which is part of the University of Central Lancashire. So I, I now split my time between uh, Scotland and Preston, and I, it's my hometown, as I said before. And but I still take on board projects that I kind of think are particularly interesting, and, and usually that I think are interesting from a perspective of a piece of research. And this project was called Kiosk. Um, is, is one where all of those things that I've just been talking about, it's kind of like improvising, prototyping, incrementally developing, using curiosity. I've kind of found a, a project where maybe I get to try that on an actual piece of architecture, um, which might end up being something very permanent. Um, but it's, it's still very, very small. And this is it. And um, someone I know um, bought this because he was interested in doing a kind of different type of project, um, creating a, a space where people could engage, test, prototype. Um, and, and so he, he bought bought this, but didn't quite know what to do with it um, at auction. Um, and it was previously being used as just a store and a kind of weird little office for some um, decorators. And we, Basically, just thought, well, what we'll do is we'll strip it out, we'll clear it out, and we'll put a little window in it to create a bit of curiosity, and then we'll just open the doors and we'll we'll start allowing people to kind of use it. And and the project's kind of conceived as now essentially being like a spare room for this street in in Govan Hill in Glasgow. So anyone on this street or in the neighbourhood, you know, who who's like flat, home, apartment, kind of isn't big enough to facilitate a certain kind of activity. But also don't want the expense of you know renting a shop for months or a year or hiring a big hall that they're not going to fill has a kind of place to to try things out um, which they can't maybe try out in in the in their home 
And so the, the only thing that we've done so far is put a window in. And this black circle was me testing out putting a window. And then someone else came and turned it into an eight ball, which is quite fun. Um, and put a cab on it as well, which is also quite good fun. Um, but then, you know, that kind of inspiration for a, a kind of round window came from looking at kind of civic, public buildings. So the idea of kind of taking a very small building, but giving it a sense of something public and civic was quite interesting. And so the kind of round window became a useful motif for that. And this is the, the window. Um, so this uh, was built by a guy with a workshop just along the road. Um, all these like, kind of pink concrete quarters were all cast in his workshop. And then he cut an amazingly accurate round hole in this wall, um, installed this, installed the glass. And he also creates a, a thing called Merle, which is this quite amazing, colourful um, little project, product here, um, which we kind of used as a little kind of inset, something kind of different. Um, and again, you kind of have something that has just creates, it's kind of a bit weird, it's a bit unique, draws people's attention, but it's not so big that we have to then start putting roller shutters over it. So it, so the, so it always looks kind of inviting rather than, you know, during the evening or when it's not being used, looking aggressive, you know, it's quite the opposite. It's kind of quite friendly looking. And, and then, and then the other side of that, we've just built this, um, which is either a seat or it's a stage. Um, or it's um, somewhere to, to gather um, for a conversation. And then, you know, the kind of space can then be used in multiple ways. Um, we've got a surface here that you can kind of project onto, exhibit onto, uh, draw onto, or whatever. And, and that's kind of it for now. But that might then become um, a... You know, this this whole building in the future might actually go up two more stories. We might build on top of this, and and that will kind of whether we do that and how we do that is going to be informed by what activity starts to emerge or establish itself uh, in the space. And I'll stop there and take any questions. I'm muted, so. Thanks so much, Lee. I'm going to do gallery view. Um, any questions? Yeah, uh, thanks so much, Lee. That was really interesting, actually. I, I've noticed throughout the talk your interest in um, education. Yeah. It's sort of, um, you know, sort of very, very apparent in, in your whole practice. What are your feelings towards first, Buckminster Fuller, and secondly, uh -huh. Joseph Boyd's just bring Joseph Boyce in because of his education within the you know, fine art more so than you know, sort of architecture and construction? Well, I mean, I think with, with those, I suppose, two people, I mean, the, the, the kind of things that I'm interested in, again, are like that kind of um, tension between um, trying to design too hard and too much. And, and and being able to design enough that can be interpreted, adapted, repeated. You know, so like Buckminster Fuller, for example, <coughs> creates a geodesic dome thing that can now be someone's greenhouse in their garden. And you can kind of go online and learn how to do that in a complicated way or a basic way. Or it becomes a, a huge, massive thing, you know, or, or it essentially ends up manifesting itself as like the Eden Center or something like that, you know, it kind of, yeah. and so, so that idea of being able to come up with something that um, is visually, you know, visually has a distinct language, um, but is concept, not just physically, but conceptually kind of re repeatable at a whole variety of scales, I think is really interesting. So it's like, so even the thing, like the thing built in Venice is just a series of towers mm -hmm. and, like each one, we, we had to um, um, go through, a, like jump through a lot of hoops, um, hoops that City of Venice put up, hoops that the Biennale put up. And one of those, obviously, is that it won't fall down, you know, a basic one. But, but we can't, you know, it's a temporary thing, so I can't dig foundations. And actually, if you dig foundation into Venice, you're just going to hit some wooden stilts after about a meter and start, you're kind of... 
water pissing up through the ground or something. Um, <laughs> I want everything to be nice and level, you know, so I kind of, we, we need to make sure these things aren't going to fall over, but I don't want to kind of cave, I don't want to peg it, I don't want loads of ties. And so like an engineer we were working with just came up with the idea of let's put a pond in the bottom of every tower. So we'll basically use water, because there's a shitload of that in Venice, as, as, the, you know, as, the, as the ballast, you know, and so, and, and so that, it's, so, so that's another kind of part of it is also a kind of interest in engineering uh, and an interest in how pragmatism actually becomes quite creative. Yeah. Um, but also, again, the idea then that actually that thing that we made in Venice could be made in a huge amount of variations. Like I arranged those towers and then put planks between the towers to create something that looks quite big. But then you could arrange those towers in loads of configurations. Everything is designed on a 1.2 by 1.2 meter grid in width, in height, in length. Um, and you stick a, you, you build a massive bucket at the bottom of it and put water in it and it's good to go wherever, you know, and I suppose um, I can kind of give the drawings for that to anyone and quite happy to do so. And, and a, a community anywhere in the world who can get hold of wood that is basically 50 by 50 or 100 by 50 can go and knock the socks off and, and build something twice as big or half as big or or whatever. And so I think, again, that's that's something I think people like Buckminster Fuller who I suppose like things that appear as like very, very, uh, like from an engineering point of view, appear very complex, but actually end up being things that anyone starts to be able to engage with. Anyone can kind of take that on board. And I think that kind of making, well, making the act of making accessible and democratizing it and demystifying it um, is, is quite important for, for me and quite interesting. I'm very interested in my role as an architectural educator because a lot of that does appear to be quite mystifying and it does often appear to be really complex and does suggest that, you know, unless you've done seven years of something and got two degrees, you shouldn't be allowed to build anything, you know. So, 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 you know, so that, so, so I've kind of been taught in a culture that kind of suggested that a lot of what I do isn't what what you should do you know really yeah. so i'm kind of interested in making that the act of making structures and buildings accessible and not something that you immediately think right and if I need to hire an architect or i need to hire an engineer i need someone professional to do that you know so creating environments where people can explore that themselves is, is quite critical that's really interesting yeah, and it's a really great take actually because you know I, I always find I work with architects quite often, and you know I find that they're 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 happier, you know, sort of working with this sort of like structural veneer, you know, yeah, and not really let, allowing much accessibility into their whole kind of design. Um, and it's really refreshing to see, you know, you're pragmatically developing concepts which essentially are to do with bringing the immediate environment very much into the well mucking in as as yeah. you were you know, sort of describing and, and as, as, yeah i suppose the other aspect of of that was you know other, other than that last project which i've had someone make quite a nice refined concrete thing and a beautiful window but again that person lives in that area you know has a student that area, works in that area. It's a kind of way of engaging with the nature of that place. But other than that, I mean, pretty much everything that I've shown can be built with a, a drill, some screws, a spanner, and a hammer. Like there's no, cra it's like totally devoid of craft. You know, it's like proper <laughs> nasty. <laughs> like, but 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 I'm kind of, but again, that was something that I've always been really interested in too. Is like actually how can you make something really beautiful with just some screw, just something you can get out of B&Q, one drill, a hammer and a handsaw. Mm. And like, if all you need is one source of power to charge a drill battery and everything other than that window was, was built in that way, you know, everything was yeah. built using a few rechargeable batteries with, with a drill. And, and so that again helps kind of, create that accessibility because I kind of, if I can teach a kid 
to use a drill safely and a handsaw and we can still build some of these things that's quite cool you know and, and not having to take them through like a 12 week uh, carpentry course you know or or whatever um and and again i'm not against craft but i'm also kind of interested in like how you get i mean it's like playing playing a musical instrument you know you kind of try things out you know you don't just move straight onto you know playing or composing your own complex compositions there's a there's a journey before you get to that level and i think that what a lot of kind of making does is it it doesn't allow that initial step into that you know it's like you're either going to learn how to do stuff at this high end and if you can't do that then you can't do it you know at all and and that's that's kind of i suppose my critique of architecture in a way you know is that it kind of says it suggests that you can't do stuff until you've done all of this and we're actually all you need to do is know how to use a drill safely use a handsaw safely have some wood have some screws and actually you can do loads of cool stuff or you can find some rope and wrap it around some wood. I mean, that's just screws, a cable tie, you know. So, so the, 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 and again, so that kind of just really um, create. I like that. I like, it's like just simple, easy to learn, repetitive acts. Like yeah. just a great, way, great way into something, you know. That's exemplified quite well with your uh, view behind you currently on the in the screen because that's yeah. like refinement, <laughs> repetition of presumably is it cutting the same wood? Yeah, yeah, because because yeah. well, well, I mean this this again is like totally devoid of craft as well. You know, it's but it like is it might, it, yeah, it, it might look all right from where you are, but it's like when you get <laughs> like, right up to it. It's, it's it, but but again, I mean this this is just very, very cheap strips of wood. And then when we put it up and we had the offcuts, we just started cutting the offcuts at, foot, like, at an angle and then sticking them in between and made that, that pattern. You know, but again, I never drew that. You know, there, there's never been a drawing of that. There's never, there's never been a kind of a, 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 a set of details, set of plans or whatever. You're you know, a bit like just... an abstract painter. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think, I mean, that, that's what I was always enticed by. I mean, I was like always um, mm. well, enticed and frustrated by the fact that architecture didn't seem to be something that you could improvise. And that was really frustrating. And that's why I kind of looked towards visual artists, musicians, you know, performers. Yeah. Um, and was, was very interested in how kind of modes of practice that are just accepted within you know art disciplines don't didn't really seem to have a place or be accepted within within architecture so you know i mean this is something i was saying at, at another discussion a few weeks ago where i started to realize i found myself in a kind of weird place at one point where there is no funding in architecture to do any of the work that i've been doing really <laughs> you know there's not but there is funding in the art world to kind of do the stuff I've been doing. But then when I ask for money from the art world, they say you're an architect, you posh bastard. Uh, you're spewing in loads of money. You know, <laughs> fuck off. You know, so they're like, well, oh, you're an architect. You, you know, it's like, oh, you, you must be on like 60 grand a year and kind of what, what you mean? You want like 2,000 pounds to find you about some wood? You know, you're like, what, what? This, what's this about? You know, so, so I kind of had to, it's like pretend... I wasn't, it's like calling myself an architect for a while was not a good way of me being able to do any of these projects yeah. because the, 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 you know, it's like the money that I'm trying to get to do these projects is like either like environmental money or it's arts money um, or bits of kind of regeneration arts? money. Sorry? Is that even Arts Council? Well, yeah, it's like, especially like Creative Scotland. You know, like when I started looking for money through Creative Scotland, it's like you just you do not want to say you're an architect. They don't want they they, they don't want to fund arch. You know, it, it's like they don't want to be in a situation where they look like they're funding professionals because right. we're all meant to be doing all right. <laughs> or, or, you know, it's like or society thinks that we're all doing all right. You know, so you imagine if you're an artist coming out of 
you know, art school or mid career, and you 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 getting money and you find out it's gone to an architect. You know, you're like, what? It's like, why? And so it's funny. It's funny that you say that actually, because I, I one of my um, ex students, um, she. She, she she applied. I can't remember where it was in London. It was a borough in London. You know, it was advertised as being very. It was for the people of that borough, and you know, the and for an artist. And yet, yeah. behold, a, a an architect in I don't know something like Kensington got it. You know, so it's uh -huh. like, you know, it, <laughs> and and she was she got back to me. She was fuming about it. But I mean, to be honest, with you, I mean. I, I'm surprised that the Arts Council don't allow you to, you know, interact because, you know, especially yeah. with what you are developing. I mean, you're, you're developing something very accessible. It's, it's, it's. No, I mean, I mean, like I say, I mean, I ended up managing to get funding through those routes, but I kind of had to come at that in, in like, I as an architect, yeah. I could never get that money, really, right? So what I needed to do was like work with arts organisations, so they commission me actually as an artist. Which, you know, it's like the stuff, like the, all the stuff that was done with the rope, was you know funded through Creative Scotland. But I I didn't apply for that, you know, like uh, as a practitioner, um, a, an arts organisation applied for that money and then picked four artists, practice or whatever, and I worked with an artist on it as well. Um, right. And you know, it, and it's the same with some other stuff I've done, where you know, a, a charity or a local organisation or a group is is applying for the money, uh, and then I'm kind of you know delivering that. Uh, and and I think that that's something that's really missing in architecture um, is the is the opportunity as an individual to kind of get get a little bit of money to develop your practice. You know, and again, yeah. like that that's it kind of accepted. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's accepted in the art world that you know you, you can get bits of money, you do residences, you're provided with some space to try, you know. Uh, but but there's nothing like that kind of in in the architecture world, you know. So we, really? we then have to kind of try and dip into that to 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 find that space to be um, playful or experimental because that's not something that you know if you're working for an architecture practice. Yeah. You, you, you're okay. not, there's not going to be a huge amount of time that you get to be playful and experimental. You know, it's kind of. Oh, of course not. I mean, so, I mean, how many of your friends? I mean, I, I'm not sure. Where, where did you study? Well, at Strathclyde University in Glasgow. Right, right. And I mean, so how many of your peers, your contemporaries, you know, are now working in actual practices? Yeah, well, most most of them. Um, yeah. You know, they're either working for other people, working for themselves as architects. I mean, um, I what one thing that <clears throat> did happen, which was interesting, was when I uh, did the did the, the the bench and the 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 bin for my degree project. When I started my final year, myself and another student actually set up a, a company and we set up a practice, um, and we couldn't call ourselves architects at that point because we weren't fully qualified. But we could still set up a design practice, and because I was doing these um, live interventions in this north of Glasgow, that kind of got the attention of a local housing association. And essentially, straight out of university, we were employed to start analysing their neighbourhoods, suggesting small. You know, so they really bought into this idea that actually a strategy of small-scale tactical interventions could be of value. Um, yeah. And so, but but I'd kind of anticipated that might be a possibility, and set up a company before we started the year, so that if that did transpire, we could say, "Hey, we're this company." And what was this? Sorry. Was, well, that was that it? company was called M8 Creative, but then we we did that together, myself and and Leslie, for about three years, and then went our separate ways. Uh, and she she I think was keener on doing more architecture for maybe whoever would pay for it and I was keen on trying to keep following this route that we developed through our thesis project um, yeah. of the kind of you know participatory engagement in place and people getting involved in making stuff so I then kind of set up Baxendale as, as myself and carried on that that journey basically but what what us setting up this company or practice 
in our final year meant that in subsequent years following that in the architecture department at Strathclyde loads of people have done it and it kind it of is. yeah yeah you know and, and so that kind of helped and, and actually I mean before us um, and I actually found this out later but before us other people had kind of done it about 15 years earlier 20 you know so I think so so Strathclyde architecture department kind of had a pre-existing kind of culture of like activism and just getting on and doing stuff and then we kind of established a kind of model of just setting up a practice before you're qualified and just doing stuff um, and so quite you know so so a few a few um people have kind of emerged out of that and, and established practices that work very much in a kind of social context um but then i spent nine ten years teaching at glasgow school of art in the architecture department there no one did that ever you know in architecture never you know no one, and it was like you you get your architecture degree and then you go and work for someone cool in london you know or you work for a, a decent practice in glasgow you know there, there wasn't no one no one there um or at least for a very long time had kind of even attempted to do that so it's been quite interesting in terms of my peers seeing that if i look at even like all every architecture practice that has been set up in say glasgow and edinburgh since i graduated they're, they're pretty much mainly people who came out of Strathclyde, you know, really? like a lot of the art, a lot of the Macintosh School of Architecture graduates end up going elsewhere or joining a practice and they go on and do great stuff, but not necessarily in, in Scotland, you know. Um, so I, I, yeah, I've, I've kind of, I meet more ex students and more graduates of art school architecture when I'm in London, you know, than when I'm in Scotland. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Does anyone have any uh, other question? There's a few people who haven't got a video on, so don't know. Um, I've got a question. Because of like your link with uh, education and obviously your own practice, I was just wondering if you have, if you had one bit of advice that you could give a student who might be interested in getting involved in kind of socially engaged pro projects or large-scale builds on site what would it be well um just a second the reason i'm saying just a second is i was asked to write a letter for an architecture magazine called the architectural review which is a, a letter to a student <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I'm just going to see uh, what I wrote. <laughs> I, might, I, might be able to, I might be able to answer your question. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of my, my, my main, I think, advice and what I, you know, I think was like, even saying in this 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 letter was that. Um, the kind of the the main main thing I was kind of saying in in this letter that was that a lot of the questions and a lot of the answers to questions are right there in front of you right now, and you know in architecture especially not just in architecture but in in a lot of subjects you know you you kind of you look for texts yeah and you look for inspiration and you look for heroes and you look online and i don't really do any of that anymore and i kind of feel that a kind of empathic engagement with the world around you will reveal enough to respond you know and so i i, I like to kind of tell students to kind of you know it's like ask yourself like what what made you angry today what pissed you off what frustrated you because they're the questions you know and like what is it that made you laugh what is it that made you smile because they're the answers basically and like if you can kind of like translate that stuff that brings you joy and extend that into into other situations where you don't see that then that's what you should be kind of trying to do 
and and that's really what like all all of the work that I, I've been doing is 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 about you know it's kind of about um you know the, like I mean the other thing I I put in this letter was about how you know if if whoever's reading this letter I've written is basically reading a niche architecture magazine then they're probably quite privileged you know in some way I mean I'm not, I'm not saying they're rich I'm not saying whatever but if if you've got to the point where you're reading a niche architecture magazine you're probably doing all right in some fashion you educated you connected you whatever and i have a huge amount of privilege as well and my role is to ex is, is to extend that you know is to extend that privilege and that's the other thing like kind of in telling students as well like i mean if you've got to the point where you are a student of anything then again you probably have some level of privilege um that again has nothing to do with wealth or class or whatever but you you're in a position of empowerment um and what you should be looking to do is kind of extend that privilege and extend that empowerment to those who are denied that through no fault of their own um and you know, where that opportunity exists is actually often much much closer than you think and you know the, the way in which you can respond and react to that is often much much closer than you think uh, as, as well you know so that's kind of my advice is like start with your immediacy you know it's like it, it's it's like the best thing someone might do today is just make someone else a, a, a cup of tea and that's that's all right you know that's kind of pretty cool you know it's like this it's like find where that moment of generosity can be and just keep just extending that a little bit further but um I think people kind of try and get wrapped up too much in the big idea. I think the other thing that I say to students is again is like a lot of people spend so much time looking to the past or looking to the future that they just forget about now. Like they forget they, they, they use an examination of the past or they're using a, a projection of the future almost as a way of kind of you know ha running away from the responsibility with dealing with the here and the now. Um, and I kind of think that if we kind of deal with that immediacy and that here and now, then actually the future looks after itself. You know, it's like if we kind of get get it right now in the next five minutes, in the next hour, the next day, then actually the the kind of good stuff is gonna it'll it'll, it'll be okay. You know, so that's kind of what what I kind of advocate for and and, and advise the student in terms of getting involved in this kind of thing. It's like don't be don't be fearful. Don't try and just just try and find find a question, conceive an answer, test it, play with it, um, and 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 don't be too too worried. You know, don't be too concerned. And sometimes you're going to fuck stuff up. Sometimes people are going to um, criticise you. People are going to say what you do is shit. People are going to say you should you you wasted money. You spent too much money. You shouldn't have done that. You should have done this. But you know. You, you, you can each of those scenarios is also is also a, a, an opportunity to learn and and grow and develop as well so i think yeah don't 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 run away from from the difficult question i'd say amazing thank you really 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 Thanks. um sorry i know you go no i i i really i think a great talk really really good talk really brilliant talk and i i like your style as well of talk it's, uh, it's fantastic. At this point, we always give the individual a round of applause. Thank you so much, Lee. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah, I appreciate it. And and like if anyone.